So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, now we come to chronic obstructive lung diseases, especially COPD. And uh, these are my conflicts of interest, especially the first one for both systems you will see afterwards. And this is what I would like to present you within the next 15 minutes. So this is first the clinical context. We use uh, CO2 removal at the moment in patients with COPD, which is not so clear. And then in the second part, I will give you some, some data on the breathing regulation of patients with COPD on extracorporeal CO2 removal, especially if you combine that with NIV. I guess um, it's quite common in, in Europe, and I guess also in the US now, that uh, these extracorporeal CO2 removal systems are used to rescue the life of a patient if you have a respiratory acidosis, which cannot be controlled by invasive mechanical ventilation alone. These are, for example, the cases of this near-fatal asthma or so, but we see that once per year, not more. It's a very seldom disease nowadays on the ICU. But at least in Europe, we have a rapidly increasing discussion um, to use this CO2 removal systems in severe COPD. And the hypothesis which is generated is that these systems can allow early extubation or even avoid invasive ventilation, and therefore all these related side effects, you know, and complications of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. And in 2015, we have to ask a question if we have any evidence for it. I can say we have nearly no clinical evidence, but we have some pathophysiological evidence I will show you in a while. Or does it even harm the patient? Because all the extracorporeal systems have side effects, especially clotting and bleeding. So you have to, to weight it against the clinical benefit you can have from such a system. And I guess you all know the advantage of non-invasive ventilation in acute exacerbation of COPD. You have a very low number needed to treat to prevent one, one intubation and to reduce the mortality. And this has become widely accepted, I guess, during the last 10 years, that NIV is a first-line intervention for a patient with acute exacerbation of COPD. And I would like to stress that you should use it early in the course of the respiratory failure if the respiratory acidosis results in a pH between 7.20 to 7.35. And we know that it reduces the mortality and especially uh, it can avoid endotracheal intubation. But what would, do we do with the patients in whom NIV fails? These are around about 10 to 25 percent, depending on the study you see of early and uh, late NIV failure. We first, before we think of any technical aspects on the ICU, we have a discussion with the patient and with the relevance. Because COPD is a chronic disease, especially patients with a severe lung emphysema. They have a long history of breathlessness. Some of them have a very, very high number of exacerbations. And first, we go for an end-of-life decision and question that with the patient and with the relevance. If we decide that the patient goes to the ICU, we optimize the setting. We heard a lot about synchrony. We also use NAVA. Especially, we, we stress the mask, we stress sedation, and so on. But we have quite a number of patients, and these are around about 10 to 20 percent, where you have to intubate them because you have to immediately save the life. We use the pH around about 7.1, not 7.2, but you all know that you have more complications. And what we do not like are these patients with this long-term weaning phase in COPD with all the side effects the invasive mechanical ventilation has. And why has NIV such a big advantage? And to my mind, this is one of the most important studies in COPD on ICU from Laurent Brochard. And uh, you see this very impressive difference in nosocomial infections. And that does not mean only ventilator-associated pneumonia, around about 25 or 23 percent here in invasive mechanical ventilation, COPD, but also in urinary tract infections or catheter-related uh, infections. So that means if you can keep the patient on NIV, that offers you some advantages in your clinical course. We have this trial from Chandra from the dates from the US from 1998 to 2008. We know that if a patient stays with NIV and if he, uh, if he survives with NIV, we have a very low in-hospital mortality of around about 7%. We have an in-hospital mortality of around 25%, which decreased slightly over the years. But those patients who have to be intubated have an increasing mortality from 20 to 30% within the last uh, 10 years. So, this led to the concept that we should avoid 
the invasive mechanical ventilation or that we allow an early extubation. Clearly, we have a lack of clinical evidence in 2015, but we have some pathophysiology aspects of this concept. So first, we did, therefore, a physiological animal study. We then went to Uppsala, and um, since intensivists are familiar with hemodialysis catheter, we tested the hypothesis, if you can use this catheter or a preferential catheter that's from from a company with a very preferential design. These are 20 euros, these are 2,000 euros. And uh, we induced a severe respiratory acidosis, like we should mimic or like we mimic an acute exacerbation of COPD with NIV failure, simply by increasing the dead space ventilation in the pigs. The mechanical ventilation was kept stable. And uh, we used a system with a membrane surface of around about one square meter. So you can measure the CO2 removal of the system physically in the exhaust of the oxygenator. And even with the hemodialysis catheter, you can remove CO2 with 200 ml blood flow. So it's around about 50 to 60 ml. With a 19 French catheter with a higher blood flow, you can remove more CO2 up to 150 ml per minute. And if you think that a patient on the ICU produces around about 250 ml, that is around about 50 to 60% of the total CO2 production. But if you would transfer that into a clinical context, what does that mean? Is the CO2 removal of this very low flow system enough? We guess not. If you look at the pH value, and if you think you have an exacerbation or a patient with a pH of 7.1 or 7.0, you cannot increase the pH value into a safe range of around about 7.4 or 7.35 to 7.4. You need higher blood flow rates, and we think that you need around about 750 to 1 ml 1,000 milliliter per minute to increase the pH from 7.0, 7.1 into the safe range of 7.4. If you now transfer this animal data to clinical practice, and if you think of a patient with an NIV failure with a severe respiratory acidosis who is put on extracorporeal CO2 removal, that might be enough. You know if the patient has a lower breathing frequency because he has of the system also leads to an unload and he reduces his breathing frequency and therefore is dynamic hyperinflation, you have a second effect. On the other hand, you can combine it with NIV. So the NIV in part reduces the CO2. It might be that you can use also lower blood flows. I don't know at the moment. And both methods leads to a reduced breathing frequency. And at the end, if we, uh, if we wean the patient from the system, we always go for NIV to avoid re-exacerbation. And therefore, we had a closer look on this patient, on, on this concept, if this works or not. Um, Jacob already uh, uh, showed you our results from the ALDS patients. These are now patients with COPD. These are five patients, and this is one example. They all had a very severe COPD or after lung volume reduction surgery. And this is our weaning protocol from extracorporeal CO2 removal and transition to NIFNAVA. We start with a blood flow of 1,000 ml per minute. We reduce it to 500 ml. Then we turn the sweep gas off, which is always 10 liter per minute, and then we come back to 1 ml. And what we see, pretty much the same as we, as we could show in the patients with AODS. Patients tend to keep the CO2 very stable, and especially the pH value, around about 7.4. And how do they do it? If they are on NIFNAVA, they do it by increasing their respiratory drive. And that's pretty much the same like the patients in AODS. If you go to the five patients and the work is still under progress, if you look at it, we have a CO2 removal of around about 150 ml per minute with one liter blood flow. So the data from the pigs correspond very much to the data in the humans. And if you reduce the extracorporeal CO2 removal, patients with very severe COPD tend to keep the pCO2 very stable, and especially the pH very around about 7.4. So this is a physiological response if you remove CO2 
And it seems that it's uh, intact in patients with uh, COPD, like it is in patients with AODS. And they all adapt their respiratory drive to the reduced extracorporeal CO2 removal. In red, it's always turned off. So this is the highest respiratory drive the patients have. And if you look here, if you lower the CO2 removal by the system, the higher the ED signal is and the higher the respiratory drive of the patients is. In 2015, we have for this concept very limited clinical evidence. This is the only study we have from Mark Ranieri's group, which is matched to a historical control group. And they used a very low flow system, and they reported quite a high number of uh, clotting in the system. That's the reason why we do not use such a, such a low blood flow. And if you match it against a historical control, you see that those patients who are treated with NIV plus extracorporeal CO2 removal have a lower incident of endotracheal uh, intubation than those when uh, they did not. This is the dark side of ECMO, and uh, I guess these are the lessons we learned from AODS. We have the same problems, sometimes even more. We see sometimes severe bleeding, so this is a, is a negative side of ECMO. We see more thrombosis with the low flow systems than with the high flow systems. And this is, for example, a case of an heparin-induced thrombocyte type 2. And this is a clot in the system which induced a severe hemolysis, and this leads to a kind of cirrus uh, in the patient. That's the reason why I always say carefully select the patient, and I guess one should do that in clinical trials. To conclude, CO2 removal systems can immediately save lives. They have the potential to allow early extubation or even avoid invasive mechanical ventilation. We guess that you need a blood flow of around about one liter to increase the pH value from 7.0 to 7.4. And even patients with very severe COPD tightly regulate their pH value by adapted respiratory drive to the extracorporeal CO2 removal. But I guess the most important point is we have to prove this evidence in a clinical trial, and I hope that we start with the first randomized trial, that's a PIPE trial, in 2000, at the end of 2015 or 2016. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. I, I wonder which patients you would pick, because in my opinion, if a patient is on invasive mechanical ventilation with COPD, you always get him off. They rarely ever die on the ventilator. So I think that the benefit for the extracorporeal CO2 removal should be in the long run, maybe. What's your opinion about it? Yeah, I, that's, a, the, that's the most, most difficult and important question to find the right patient for the system. I mean, if you, you saw, it, it took us a long time to get five patients who survived with the system and who could be weaned from it. And we have three, 400 exacerbations per year in our hospital. So the number you have for this extracorporeal systems is very, very low. And these are only patients, for example, after lung volume reduction surgery who have a problem. We want, do not to intubate to increase the air leak who are uh, very prone to, to more pneumonia. Or those patients who are very young and have something you can treat, uh, pneumonia or this winter influenza or so. But I guess we have to pick up the right patient and that's a problem at the moment. Laura. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, a, a little bit the, the same question. In, in uh, Marco Ranieri and Stefano Nava study, uh, they tried to select patients at risk for NIV failure. But when it, they use their criteria in the control group, this uh, criteria for being at risk of intubation, the intubation rate was only 35%. Yeah. So, which means uh, even in those, we are not very good at predicting the, those who will be intubated. So would you see the indication more for preventing intubation or more in those already intubated to separate yeah. them from I, the I guess uh, there, there are two aspects. First, the safety reason. I would not do that to prevent intubation because of safety reasons. We have to be, because this, the systems have complications, and I guess it's better to first go for invasive ventilation. And uh, the second part I would like to answer with the study protocol of the PIPE trial. And the study protocol is done by first intubation, then the first spontaneous breathing trial. And if the patient fails the spontaneous breathing trial, 
the patients are randomized within 48 hours to the extracorporeal system versus conventional mechanical ventilation. And this is the way we do it at the moment. In our clinical practice, we do two spontaneous breathing trials within 24 hours, not earlier than 24 hours, or even we do one extubation and then switch to NIV, and then we do the CO2 removal only if they are reintubated. If you have these patients on non-invasive ventilation and extracorporeal CO2 removal, how often does it happen that the system is too efficient that you completely lose your respiratory drive? We didn't see that in patients with COPD. We saw that in patients with ARDS and especially in small women uh, who have a CO2 production of what, around about 150 ml CO2 or something like that. Then sometimes it's too efficient, but this is the point that you should remove the system. If you are so efficient, then you do not need it, to my mind, and that's, then we do not use it. Okay. Thank you.